I'm truly excited to introduce Dr. Jeff Duncan Andrade. Dr. Duncan Andrade is an associate professor of Raza Studies and Education at San Francisco State University and the director of the Educational Equity Initiative at the Institute for Sustainable Economic, Educational, and Environmental Design. In addition to these duties, he serves as a high school teacher in East Oakland, California, where for the past 21 years he has practiced and studied the use of critical pedagogy in urban schools. He's also the founder of Roses in Concrete, an organization devoted to providing critical wraparound services, love, and support to high school students from underserved urban neighborhoods. Dr. Duncan Andrade has lectured around the world about the elements of effective teaching in schools serving poor and working class children. He's authored two books and numerous journal articles and book chapters on the conditions of ur urban education, urban teacher support and development, and effective pedagogy in urban settings. Please welcome me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Jeff Duncan Andrade. as I go. Is that okay with everybody? Um, so I, I'm just going to try and give a few thoughts about your conference theme. Um, reframe, reimagine, reignite. Uh, we'll start with reframe. Um, in indigenous communities around the globe, there is uh, a core practice which um, has been maintained, and I'm going to speak specifically about um, the way in which the Cherokee Nation in, in uh, Western indigenous traditions um, operates around this particular tradition. And in the Cherokee Nation, uh, when major decisions were made, like, I don't know, how they're going to educate their children. Uh, there's a process that happens in the community for decisions to be made about that, which I think is important to consider given that I'm at a school of management conference. Okay? And when you think about being a, a, a manager, okay, it's very different than being a leader. Okay? Um, and and in the Cherokee principle, okay, the, the leaders um, were often the council of elders. And so they would convene the entire community to talk about uh, whatever the decision was that, that, that needed to be considered and made. And they would listen to the entire community about what they wanted and what was important to them. And then uh, after they had taken the time to literally listen to everybody that had a point of contribution, a thought around what should happen with this decision, then they would um, withdraw uh, into their own chambers and the elders would discuss what they had heard and they would um, put their own opinions in. And then the chief elder, before the decision could made, so could be made. So once they had sort of settled on, okay, this is how we want to proceed. Before the final decision could be made, the chief elder would ask um, the rest of the group one final question. And the last question always was, is it good for the children? No matter what the decision was. Okay? So it wasn't just if it was about children or education, because what indigenous communities have understood for quite some time is that every decision is about children in the end. If you're trying to build a society or a community that's going to be healthy and sustainable. And in my experience in 21 years teaching in my own community, I live in a 3400 block of East Oakland, I teach, literally teach my neighbor's children that is never a question 
that we are asking when we're making some of the most impactful policy and practice decisions in our schools. And so as leaders, I challenge you to hold off on decision making until you have clearly vetted that question, not with yourself, but with the community. Okay? If you're going to come into our communities and lead, okay, it is critical okay, that our communities are the ones who are really driving the leadership decisions that you're making that are going to be affecting our babies. Okay? And right now, okay, we have a paradigm okay, that needs to be reframed because the history of public schools and communities like mine is one where things, so-called leaders, okay, continually do things to us, okay? not with us, not for us. Okay? So you need look really no further than that okay, to begin to see what appears to many people that are outsiders to our community as an intractable set of conditions and outcomes. Okay. But once you really get into the guts of it, okay, you realize that there is a logic behind why so many young people are so resistant to what's happening in schools, what's being offered to them. Okay. So if you're going to reframe the conversation around education, then let's reframe okay, by beginning to understand the difference between schooling and education. Okay, or what in my community we call educación. Okay. Schooling is the process of institutionalizing people. Okay. And this is what young people reject. Okay. Educación, okay, or education, is the process of humanizing people. Okay. And this is what young people embrace. Okay. So any reframing of the conversation needs to be attentive to the fact that historically, okay, in communities of color, in poor and working class community, okay, the investment has been made in schooling. And as long as that investment continues, you will continue to see the same outcomes. Okay. If you want to shift that paradigm, if you really want to move the meter, okay, then you've got to be willing to reframe the very purpose okay, of why it is that we're engaging in this process of educating young people. So what is the purpose of public schools? Well, that commands some, or at least insists, okay, that we do some reimagining. Now, when I was coming up, I'm the youngest of seven kids, and my brothers and sisters were not doing things in school or in the broader the community that would suggest that they would be standing in front of this mic right now. And so when I came into the gig, okay, I had sort of learned from them how to do what you needed to do on the streets, how to do what you needed to do right external to the building, and then how to come in and play that game. Okay, and, 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 and so I was treated differently than them. And, and people, literally, teachers would say to me, you're not like your brother. You know, you're not like your sister who's locked up. And I would think to myself, how the hell did you get in front of me? Because I am my brother, and I am my sister, and I'm just like them. And that's what you don't understand. Only thing is, I'm playing you. I'm playing your game, and you think you're helping me. Okay? But you have no idea, because you don't want to know. You don't live on my block. You won't come to my block, especially not when the sun's down. Okay? But you want to stand up here, okay? and indeed the state has sanctioned you to stand in front of me okay? and make all these decisions that are going to have this massive impact okay? on the outcome of my life. Okay? And teachers used to say stuff to me all the time, like, you can use school to escape this neighborhood. Okay. And so the, the purpose of school in my community, in so many communities like mine, okay, was to escape the neighborhood. Okay. 
And I never understood that. Because I didn't want to escape my neighbor. Do you understand me? Do you understand the code that's underneath that when we tell kids that? Okay? When we say, right, that you can use school to escape. Okay? The, the unstated narrative there okay, is something about my mother, about my cousin on the corner, about my brother and about my sister, that they need to be escaped. That they're the problem in my life. And so many young people are asked to leave what what Tupac Shakur calls their damaged petals at the door and come in. And and we don't don't want to deal with all that because we're all about college-going culture. And you too can go to Yale like I did. And I'm literally thinking to myself, right? Fuck Yale. Okay? If Yale's not committed, okay? apparently, right, some people here from Princeton or something. <laughs> Don't be offended, Yale. I said the same thing when I spoke at Harvard. Fuck Harvard, too. <laughs> and the reason I say that is because the, there is no clear relationship between what is being proffered and offered in these institutions and the reality of the material conditions of my community. Okay? And so there's a disc so how are you preparing leaders for my community okay, if the things in which those leaders are being prepared to do are not actually going to resolve okay, the core problems of my community. Okay? So as you rethink right, the purpose, as you reimagine the purpose of education, okay, let's be clear. Okay, the purpose of education is not to escape poverty. The purpose of education is to end it. Okay? And that's a very different paradigm. Right? You cannot be telling young people right, that you can escape poverty. The teachers, few, that I deeply respected okay, were the ones who were actually engaging the real material conditions of my life and not telling me that my brother and my sister and my mother and my cousin on the corner were the people I had to escape. Okay? But instead what they were saying is, is, what is it that you visualize for your community and how can we help you in math, science, reading, writing, and all these other things, use those things to actually begin to create the community on your block, in your house, in your family that you most want to see. Third, you talk about reigniting. And the question is, why do we feel like we need to, who needs to be reignited? Because it ain't the young people that I've been teaching for the last 21 years. I'm trying to chill them out. (laughs) Please don't reignite young people from my block. They already keep it lit. (laughs) So I'm going to end, right, with, this is actually usually where I start. But I'm going to end with um, a story that my mother, or, or a lesson that my mother used to give to me. And, and, and I told you I'm the youngest of seven kids, and so as the youngest of seven kids, anybody here the youngest from a big family? Okay, so you'll feel me on this. Everybody else would not understand this at all. <laughs> as the youngest of seven, seven kids, I often felt like it was my birthright to complain <laughs> about everything. And I remember one time I came in the house, and I was ranting and raving about something, and my mother stops me in the middle of my rant. She points at the kitchen table, and she says, sit down. So I go to the table and I sit down. My mother goes in the kitchen. She takes a glass. She fills it halfway with water. She comes back and she sits down. She puts the glass between us. She says, half full or half empty. And my mom's was good for these kind of trick questions where there is no right answer, so whatever answer you give is the wrong answer, and that's the lesson you need right now. (laughs) I didn't take the bait on this one. I just kind of stared back, back blankly and... And my mother says, son, how you choose to answer that question is how you will live your life. Because your life will always be both half full and half empty. And if you choose to see your life as half empty, if you choose to see your life for all the things that you don't have, 
you will never fill your cup. But if you can see your life as half full, if you can see your life for the things that you do have, you will fill your cup, it will overflow, and you can share that with others. And this is precisely what I think that Tupac Shakur means when he talks about young people growing up in urban poverty as the roses that grow from concrete. And what Pac says, and it's the title of his book of poetry, hey, it's probably his best-known poem, and what he actually says hey, in that poem is that when you see a rose growing in the concrete, you don't question its damaged petals. Of course it has damaged petals. It's growing in the concrete. Hey, instead, you celebrate its tenacity and its will to reach the sun. Hey, now, what I see in schools all over the country okay, is so many adults okay, seeing young people for their damaged pedals okay, instead of for their tenacity and their will to reach the sun. And what I want to be clear with everybody in this room about, everyone who stands in front of our babies chooses whether or not they see them as a glass half full or a glass half empty because they are both just like everyone in this room is a glass half full and a glass half empty. And you know that the people who move you most are the people who see you as a glass half full. Okay? That decision that we make as adults about how we see these babies in our community then dictates how they see us, whether or not they will trust us, whether or not, okay, as Herb Cole said, Herb said that young people don't care what you know until they know that you care. And so as long as we keep asking young people to leave their damaged pedals at the door and act like it's all right and just come on in, then they will continue to reject the paradigm that we offer them because it is a schooling paradigm. But when we shift that paradigm, when we see young people for their tenacity and their will to reach the sun, we see them as glasses half full in the very same school where other teachers do not. Okay? Those teachers don't have the same problems with those kids. Those teachers don't want for engagement and investment in the class. Okay? And if you know as leaders that in the very same school okay, you can have from 8 to 9 a.m. a young person fully engaged, okay, totally invested, and then at 9 o'clock go to class number two, and they are suddenly a problem, okay, then you know it can't be the child. Okay. And so in the end, hey, when we think about reframing, reimagining, and reigniting, okay, that I think it's really us that needs to be reignited, okay, not these children. They're waiting for us to reignite around the original purpose of education, okay, which is about seeing every child that walks in front of us okay, as a glass half full. Thank you.